Someone said recently that if you wanted to get a parallel for today about the cross as an emblem of torture and execution, what you would want is not the cross, but an electric chair. That would be the appropriate analogous symbol that would have for us the same chilling power that the cross had in Jesus' day. Imagine with me for a moment. Let any who wish to follow me take up their electric chair and come after me. That's about what it meant to those who heard it from the mouths of Jesus. A far cry from the way we understand the cross, because we understand the cross backwards, don't we? We are on the far side of the cross. We know what has been accomplished on the cross. We know the gift that is given because of the cross. We think of the cross as a reminder of Jesus' self-sacrifice, of Jesus' willingness to take whatever we would dish out upon him and still love us. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So from our vantage point, the cross is good news indeed. It was indeed an instrument of torture and execution, but it became an instrument God used to put things right and to start all over again with sinful humanity. God in Jesus atones, brings back, brings us home, reconciles us, erases all that is between us and God, and we are forgiven, redeemed, healed. But to those who heard this from Jesus, In this text, it would be puzzling, disturbing, off-putting, and no surprise, Peter, I'm sorry, Peter would rebuke. I'm sorry, Peter would just stop this talk. The way your mother would hiss at you in the corner if you said something rude and inappropriate in polite company. When Jesus invites us to take up our cross, the invitation is given to us with two dimensions present. One dimension of that invitation from Jesus is our willingness to do our own self-sacrificing for the sake of good, to put ourselves second rather than constantly first, to see life through the eyes of others rather than through our own egocentric viewpoint, to live as a person for others rather than for asserting our own ends, our own desires, our own preferences. It's really basically an invitation in following Jesus to care less for ourselves and to care more for others. This does not mean, I hasten to say, caring for others at the expense of ourselves or becoming one of those compulsive caregivers who has no concern for their own well-being. You know, the sort of thing that C.S. Lewis called the helping hand strikes again. (laughs) But rather to reorient the way we look at things and to do the growing up when we're young, The world is all about us. The world's about what feels good to us, what we want when we're hungry, what we want people to do for us as we grow in our life and in our Christian life. We do not see life through the lenses of our own desires, our own priority. We are rather members of a community concerned for the well-being of others, reasonable opportunities present themselves to sacrifice for others, and we do those things. Unreasonable opportunities sometimes present themselves to care for others, 
to sacrifice ourselves, and we do that. When we take up our cross, we are following the way of self-sacrifice. But the other way I believe Jesus speaks to us today about taking up our cross is for us to take up the reality of the gift, the gift that has been purchased for us by the experience of the cross. So take up your cross, dear people, not only as a way of living life in self-denial and self-sacrifice, for the sake of the gospel. But take up the cross as it's extended to you as a gift, as a pricey gift that Jesus extends you for you to accept, for you to accept as forgiveness, as new life, as promise and assurance of your eternal destination, as meaning about all that God does for you out of God's generosity and grace. So, beloved, let us take up our cross and follow. Amen.